So Joe, thank you so much for being with us here today. You are incredible. You are awesome. You. you are very generous with your time and um, we're, we're glad to have you here. We're, we're here you, for Chef. Joe to answer Q&A. So y'all just sock it to us. <laughs> Joe's here to answer all your questions. Like what is the meaning of life? Oh boy. When is, when is COVID really over? 42. <laughs> 42, <laughs> 42 is the meaning of life. That's right. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, team. I love this conference so much. I, I am really upset that we can't do this in person. It was, it was so much fun when I went in person. Um, but such, such is life. Uh, before doing a Q&A, though, I do have a, a big announcement I wanted to make. Jenison, Asuncion, and I have been playing with this idea for 10 years. And finally, today we have launched the GAD Foundation. And you can find out more information by going to the website, gaad.foundation, uh, and, and learn more over there. Um, but essentially, we're trying to take the, the mission of GAD to a whole new level. Everybody always says GAD is one day a year. Why can't we do something every day? And the goal of the foundation is to do something every day and really to change the culture of digital product development. And uh, so one of the big things was the GAD pledge. Uh, last year, Facebook took the GAD pledge to make the React Native open source project uh, uh, accessible. And they've done tremendous progress. They've uh, extended that for another year. And uh, today, Ember.js announced that they are taking the pledge. And now that we have this under the foundation, we're going to make a lot more out of it. And our goal really is to get all the open source projects to, to make accessibility a core value of the project. And this is going to affect the accessibility downstream. And we're going to do the Gaddy. Wow. Yeah. And we're going to have the Gaddies next year. So it's going to be a gala. And uh, it's going to be a lot of a lot of fun. So the Gaddies. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna honor people that have done uh, great work uh, around accessibility. So that's, so you, that's a big announcement. That is a huge announcement. That is amazing. Congratulations. Thank that's you. you know it's funny. I I went to. Um, uh, help Mike Paciello launch his WebAble TV. Uh, I think you guys sent a video over there too. Yeah. And uh, um, he asked me, you know, wh what do you think is, is uh, what do you think about GAD? And it's like, they have done an amazing job in 10 years, raising awareness. More and more people are aware of, of accessibility. It no longer, when you say accessibility, do you get deer in the headlights kind of stares. People at least are aware enough to look sheepish, like, oh yeah, yeah, accessibility. <laughs> I know we should do more, right? Yeah. So, uh, so that's great. And now this announcement to move it to the next level. Wow, that is terrific. Congratulations. You've got some questions here. Well, one is, the first one is, what is the biggest lesson you know now that you would tell yourself about GAD 10 years ago? That's a great question. Um, gosh, I mean, it, it's just taken off beyond any expectation that it's like, what I liken it to is, I thought that we were starting this where it was like Jenison and I taking a train and by hand pushing the train forward, except that it turned into a Ferrari that just took off and then <laughs> up with it. And it's really, it's really thanks to people like you, Sharon, to, uh, to Access You Always does this lead in to GAD, which is just amazing. Um, the community has, has done all these events. You know, we just had the idea, and I think we kickstarted it pretty well in the first year by asking folks to do it, but then the community has done the rest. So I, I wouldn't change a thing, honestly. I wouldn't change a thing, but I do miss Darth Jillian's mask. What, hap what happened? We've unmasked you. <laughs> Maybe she went to put on her onesie. She had oh, that no, yesterday. I, I had to take a sip out of my um, my Tupaca beer. So okay. um, I thought we were supposed to bring our favorite drinks for this. 
Yes, absolutely. I'm back. <laughs> Love that sound. My favorite drink is water because I don't drink anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> cheers. Hey, cheers. Cheers, Becky. Becky's got a glass of red wine. I need to run and get some. We, uh, we are stocked up in the kitchen. Jessica said this morning she was thinking, oh, what should I make for breakfast? Never mind, there'll be food at the office. <laughs> there is food everywhere in the office. <laughs> yeah, we're together again, which is really nice. You know, last year we did, we did uh, uh, access you, all of us separated in our living rooms. At least we're able to come back to the office. We wear our masks in the hallway, but uh, anyway. What other questions do we have while we have Joe live? We're going to talk to him here for the next uh, maybe 10 minutes or so, and then he's off to his next event, and we're going to watch the video about the, um, uh, about the whole GAD Foundation. Oh, okay. Cindy Rowland says, one of the points made by Judy Human earlier at today's keynote was a point of history in the disability movement to show up and disrupt. As you think of all of us gaddies, how do you think we can all show up and disrupt in the digital space? So Ju Judy Hellman, right? Judy Human was here at lunch and she was yeah. absolutely fantastic. I've never been so nervous in my life as yeah. interviewing Judy Human, but it went well. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. She's a hero of mine. And exactly. You, you may remember uh, the, the first keynote, I believe I had, I showed the video of the Capitol crawl and it, it was just incredible, really incredible. Have uh, you seen Crip Camp? I, I started to, but I just haven't had time to fully see it. But Oh it's man, wait till you have time to settle into, it is so good. And of course, me being an ex-hippie, it just completely, well, I shouldn't say ex-hippie, just old hippie, right? Um, she, uh, it's just the music, you know, Neil Young and all yeah. the. Come there on, is no ex well. hippie. You know, it was Once just, there, hippie, just like being a Marine, Sharon. Fantastic. I'm sorry, what? I said, once it's like being a Marine. Once you're a hippie, you're always a hippie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, let's see. Uh, there's Oh, there's all these questions coming in. Let me see. Let's see. Here we go. Let's hear it for the old hippies. Anyway, yeah, we we had a great time talking. By the time it was over, we were old friends and I wasn't nervous anymore. So so how do you think, but that is a great question. How do we show up in the digital space? Because Cindy made that point to Judy, like we've been advocating for 20 years and things haven't changed that much. Yeah. So what do we do? How do we show up and disrupt in the digital space? But it sounds like that's what your foundation is going to try to do. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're trying to disrupt that the way that we're trying to do it is, is uh, the carrot rather than the stick. And I think that the, the, where the stick needs to happen is really uh, the laws, right? Because you, you have to have both sides of it. If you don't have that foundation from the, the legal standpoint, um, then, then the rest of it is, it, it doesn't have the same teeth. So you can inspire people and you can make a lot of movement, but you need that law as a foundation in order to take it all the way home. Um, and, and this is outside of accessibility, but it's really important too. I'm still like beside myself. It's a shame, a shame that the dollar bill in the United States is not accessible. I, I, I just, I, I can't stand it. And that's one place where it'd be like, you know, let, let's protest that or, or make some movement. And maybe, maybe there's another way, which is to do some lobbying, because I think lobbying, that's, that's where it hits the pocketbook. And, and, and I think that's like a lobbying organization for this would be really helpful, perhaps combined with some kind of protest like that Capitol crawl. Well, I think Judy would agree with you about the law. She was very clear about laws are passed, but in order for them to be enforced, people have to insist on their rights. You have to show up and insist on the fact that this is my right. You have to, I'm not gonna be grateful to you because the bathrooms are accessible. Yeah. They need to be accessible without my gratitude, right? And I, th I think she would totally agree with you about the, um, the need for 
uh, for the law to, to support your advocacy. But, um, but the idea of showing up in digital space is tricky because you don't get as much attention as when you show up and occupy a building. It's easy to just click out of the internet and you just click over to the next thing. But if you're there occupying a building like they did for those 25 days, it's, it's a little harder to ignore. Anyway, I think that's a good challenge for us all to, to think about as we go forward. There's another question here. What are some tangible ways we as company employees can contribute to the success of GAD? Uh, great question. If I may, I'm just gonna uh, add on to the last point. Um, we can still do something physical and just make sure that it's Instagrammable. I, I think that would be uh, pretty cool because if it's Instagrammable, then it's digital, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, in terms of- <laughs> Mariella likes that. She's over here. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so in terms of what, what you can do inside of a company, uh, you know, we have over 200 events on globalaccessibilityawarenessday.org. Uh, which lists all the events that are happening. But there's at least 200. My guess after looking today, Ian Hamilton just posted the events for uh, gaming and that was massive. So I think we're probably more like 400 private events and people have emailed me, DM'd me, telling me about the, the private company events. You can run your own event in the company, speak, do a presentation on accessibility, share presentations. If you, you aren't you know, set up to do your own presentation, there are so many of them online that you can point them to. And um, I, people ask me all the time, uh, how can I learn about accessibility? And I always point them to, to uh, WebAIM and to the webinars that Nobility is doing um, and W3C. So there's, there's no lack of resources that you can point people to. More questions. Do we have more questions here? Let's see. I, have I one. believe showing up and disrupting. Disrupt, disrupt. Oh, Lainey says wrong. Wrong about what? Wrong about what, Lainey? Wrong. Things have changed a lot. So wrong, wrong. This is Lady High. Wrong about saying nothing's changed. Yes. Well, no, no. I mean, the web is not. I think Cindy's point when she asked it at the keynote today was that we've advocated for 20 years and the web is not more accessible based on the web aims, you know, the web aim work that they did and that. Yes. And I love web aim. It's one of my go to places. But I think we have to be careful in. You know, we always say WCAG is not accessibility. We have to be really careful. Yes, there's still problems. But when I think about when I started 1995 and there's so many companies, like Joe just said, celebrating global accessibility awareness today, doing national ads. I mean, Google doing a national ad at the Oscars with their captioning and Microsoft doing such amazing work and national ad at the Super Bowl about accessible gaming. I mean... We have to hold on to the good as we keep pushing to disrupt. I guess that's my that's my GAD message. Thank you. That's a good one. Thank you, Lainey. Becky, I, you've got a you've got a note in there, a way to show up and disrupt. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, uh, maybe it's not super disruptive, but um, Shilpi Kapoor in uh, from Barrier Break in India. Um, she created a whole page and said, you know what, go ahead and file some bugs, right? We need to tell people, go to the different COVID sites for your area, your state, your country, whatever. And she created, they created a site where you can actually go and submit a bug, right? And so that it can get directed to the right person. And I haven't had a chance to do that yet today, but the day's not over yet for me. So I will, I did look at a site, uh, the New Hampshire site where I live and yeah, there were some pretty glaring errors even on the mobile site, you know, buttons. That well, that, and that was a scandal that I think did not get enough attention is the inaccessibility of COVID and WebAIM wrote about that, that right. there were so many COVID sites around the country around the US and from what Chilpi says around the world, where the information, the critical life-saving information that people need 
is not accessible to people with disabilities who, as Judy said today, have this the um, uh, morbidity rate that just is sky high and oh, exceeds any other any other group. But Cindy Cindy Rowland did comment that the John Hopkins is also including accessibility of these sites on their national debt dashboard. So at least there's something happening here in the U.S. So that's great. Thanks, Cindy. That is great. Should we write? Should we go to the next question, Joe? Or are you yeah. going to turn into a pumpkin any second? No, let's let's do it. Okay. It says medication in the U.S. is not accessible. Oh, that's not a question. It's a comment. It's uh, it's in Germany. The packaging is always written in Braille. Woo! That's cool. Um, uh, so this question is: What is the role of the strong legal foundation that Joe just mentioned? Uh, this wonderful quote from Lizzie, somebody at the Microsoft Summit, Lizzie Kiyama, the legal framework gives us permission to dream what is possible. That is really, really, really true. Andrew, Andrew, hey, I sat in on your talk. It was great. I'll, I have to say, I didn't find a clunker at all this year. Sometimes I'll be like, yeah, that one was okay. I didn't find one. They, it was great stuff this year, you presenters. Yay, you were so good. Okay. Um, that's not a question though, Andrew. It's just a comment. Do you want to comment out loud? Andrew? Yeah, well, I was uh, earlier I was listening, uh, but I was in the kitchen because it's uh, now breakfast time or just after breakfast and I went to make another coffee. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the other side of Gad, aren't you? It's not Gad there anymore. Oh, no, that's right. Gad's been and gone. And um, yes, we had a lot of activity. Uh, you can't hear me because my microphone was out of my way as well. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been up very early this morning uh, to get the overlap uh, between uh, um, Central Time and uh, East Coast Australian Time. Um, yeah, no, we had a very successful gad yesterday. There were a lot of activities all around uh, Australia. A lot of companies were um, were running stuff internally, which was great to uh, to see. We got invited to uh, co-present um, at, at at several organisations uh, virtually, um, and uh, one in person uh, at a, um, a co um, um, sharing. Uh, co-working space which was uh, nice to do yesterday and uh, had quite a lot of interest from uh, you know what are you know probably more startup companies uh, that operate uh, in um, co-working spaces so that was really good to to see as well um, oh that's uh, great yeah um ali bites ran a series of short 10 minute talks throughout the day and then had a q a at the end of the day with the uh, the, uh, the the presenters who had presented pro uh, progressively throughout the day so uh, that was very successful too I love how I awesome. uh, uh, was involved in GAD events from the very first year. Uh, never would have expected it to go all the way to Australia just a few months after <laughs> writing the blog post. <laughs> uh, Australia has been an early adopter. It's an early adopter of technology. It was an early adopter of WCAG. Uh, we have dropped the ball a little bit late, more lately with uh, WCAG. But uh, yeah, you know, there's a lot of uh, lot of interest in Australia. And uh, yes. Um, a lot right across the board. Well, and you guys at Intopia are a big part of that too. I think you have shown such leadership. Yeah, um, yeah, we've we've uh, and we've attracted the the people that uh, show the leadership too. Love the infographic. <laughs> so we have another Thanks. question. Question for Joe. Advice for the new generation of advocates. How do we make the accessibility revolution Instagrammable? Great question. So what's interesting is that a lot of people think in order to go viral on uh, social media, the, the way is you get somebody that has millions of followers and they just tweet anything or post anything and it'll go viral. And that's not how it works. According to marketers, uh, a friend of mine actually wrote the influencer economy. Uh, and he really explained to me that the way it works is if you have smaller influencers, but they really have a passionate audience and you get a group of them together, then something goes viral. So if you 
are doing some kind of Instagrammable moment like the Capitol crawl, you have to plan it out so that you're, you're getting a group of influencers in a particular space to uh, tweet it out, put it on Instagram and do that kind of as a coordinated campaign and then it'll take off from there. Um, there's always an amount of luck to it. I don't think you can just, uh, just create your own viral movement of any kind you know, easily. Um, but probably the reason Gad took off is that in the accessibility community, we're, we're, we're all a community that tries to do the right thing. And if we see something we like, it's gonna get traction. If we see something we dislike, it's gonna get traction too. You can ask a few companies out there about that question. <laughs> you mean the overlay companies? <laughs> No comment. <laughs> Joe, I know we have to let you go. You left us a video. We'll t we'll crank that up here in a second, but we'll let you uh, at least have ten minutes before your next event. And thank you so much for coming by. It was great, as always, to see you in the middle of all this great disruption that you're doing. Thanks a million. Thank you so much. And thanks to, to the whole crowd. I love this conference so much. So uh, yes. I have one question. I have one question for the Gaddy Awards. Will there be a worst of category? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, that's a, an interesting idea. We haven't totally figured it out yet, but uh, I'll definitely bring that up at the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, Hannah. <laughs> I bet we'd have a lot of nominations for that role. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be too much work trying to narrow it down, won't it? That's true. Right. You don't have to spend too much time dedicated to identifying it. You just go like a coin flip. <laughs> take nomination. <laughs> Great. Well, thank, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Access U and everybody at Nobility. And we'll see you next year, but probably sooner. Probably sooner. I hope so. Thank you, Thanks. Joe. Thanks, Joe. Bye. Okay, well, stick around because the Accessibility Ninjas are going to figure out how to queue up that movie. And uh, we're going to see, we're going to have a watch party. Everybody grab their second favorite drink or whatever. Okay. <laughs> Let's have the, the show or the movie you. or the story Thank of Gad. Is that what it is? The third keynote in a row at Access U. And many of you have heard the story of Gad, so I will keep to a minimum the backstory and just try and share with you some new thoughts that I've had this year. For some basics, yeah, know, Global Accessibility great. Awareness Day is commonly That's referred to as Gad. It's celebrated the third Thursday every um, May. You want some wine? We're on our 10th, yeah, believe it or not, I anniversary. Have a beer. You can follow the GAAD GAD hashtag on Twitter. And what's really cool this year is that they added the logo. When you type in GAD, it will add the GAD logo to the hashtag. And the official URL is globalaccessibilityawarenessday.org. The real impetus for GAD started with my dad. And it started because he was just such a special man. He commanded respect when he walked into a room. He spoke 10 languages, 11 if you include Aramaic, and I'm not kidding. He knew the Bible practically by heart and much of the Talmud too. And he was just as good at science, which is why this is a picture of him at the NASA JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And as my dad got older, like many, he started losing his hearing, he started losing his vision. And so banking on the phone was impossible. Getting to the bank physically took a full day, really two days because he had to order Axis Paratransit the day before. And it's really hard to watch your father, particularly one who has lived life. He was a concentration camp survivor. Just watching your dad suffer is, is horrible. And as a web developer myself, I would have expected that online banking should be the solution. And unfortunately, the bank that my dad was at had an inaccessible website. And that's something that's just a shame. It, it, it just completely takes away your independence. And I was completely impotent to do anything about it, even though I was a web developer. So I wrote this blog post 
Issuing a challenge, accessibility know-how needs to go mainstream with developers now. And it got auto-tweeted and Jenison Assumption, who is on the board of nobility, saw my tweet and he said, this is a great idea, we've got to make it happen. And so in 2012, Global Accessibility Awareness Day was officially born. I'll share with you some moments through the years from the very first year, you know, you always need a celebrity to push a movement and Stephen Fry was that celebrity for us. It hit my hometown paper where it was syndicated and there were even government events in India. But unfortunately, by the second year, my dad passed away from cancer a few months before GAD, leaving my brother and I to take care of my mom who had dementia. You wanna talk about accessibility. We learned firsthand about so much. And then we started to collect logos from companies that were participating in GAD until the third year, the bank that inspired the event wrote us that they know their website is inaccessible. And so they are going to do an internal event to improve their accessibility, even though I never mentioned their name publicly. And then we started to gather more logos in year four and five. By year six, there were too many logos to fit on a slide. And so I'll skip forward to year nine, which was last year, where once again, tragedy struck and my mom passed away at noon, a half an hour after I dedicated Global Accessibility Awareness Day to her. So it is really one year since she passed. And I just, I just share it because it's all about, that is about, personal I guess the word what I'm looking for is GAD is personal accessibility is personal and it affects all of us nonetheless there were so many notable moments and I'd like to share a few of them with you Tim Cook invited Stevie Wonder to give a concert on the day the big tech companies like Microsoft, IBM, Yahoo, and Apple started to change their homepage for the day. And Microsoft released an Xbox adaptive controller, this one right here on the day. And I'm gonna play for you the Super Bowl commercial that they made. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. I only have one <laughs> and yeah i love video games my friends my family and again video games whenever i play it it makes me feel happy the fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends you make your own rules it's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it when i'm playing with a regular controller there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not gonna change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yep, yep. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. This video explains better than any, any way I could why what we do matters. Because if we build technology right, these kids can play video games. And if we don't, they can't. They, they, they don't want your pity. They just want to play video games. My mantra this year is that accessibility is not disability. First of all, it's about taking away the disability and looking at the human. 
the first time I went to the CSUN conference, I was invited to a party and there was a room that I perceived as a room full of people with disabilities. And the very next year I was invited to the exact same party and I saw a room of friends, a few friends and some people that I didn't know, but the, the folks that will be friends soon. And I really stopped seeing the disability and I started to see the human. And this is just a human thing that we have to get over. And in order to really do a good job of accessibility and evangelizing and letting other people see the importance of accessibility, we need to focus on the human and to see the people and not the disability. Another mantra of mine this year is that it's not about budget, it's about expertise. A lot of folks think about this of how much is it going to cost in order for me to make things accessible. But think of this, if you're a designer, I don't expect you to know how many people, the statistics, how many people are colorblind, 10 million in the United States. That's irrelevant. What I expect you to know is how does somebody that's colorblind going to see this picture, which is of a green button and a red button. And in this particular example, what I'm thinking of is a Skype online offline indicator, like a chat app, something like Skype or Slack. If you have expertise, you're going to know that if you're colorblind, this red and green looks like gray and gray. And so what you're going to do, because you have that expertise, is add a label and you're not going to use color to convey information and you're going to say online offline and it costs zero dollars if you do this in advance, because you have code as craft, design as craft, your company as craft. And then later, you're not gonna have to worry about something like getting sued. You're not gonna have to worry about remediating or doing an audit, then a remediation, putting it into the QA and regression because you have the expertise and you did it right the first time. If you're a 25 year old UX designer, you don't need to know how many people have color contrast issues. And I don't even know that answer myself. I tried to find it. I don't even think that there are statistics on it. I do know that I have problems with color contrast and a lot of people my age do, as you get older, it happens. And a lot of people that have visual impairments, there are 2.2 billion in the world. A lot of them have trouble with color contrast. So you don't need to know any of these statistics, but you have to know that your 25 year old eyes do not operate the same way as other people. So when you're over 50, you're gonna have trouble with a contrast and you need to, to do something about it. And again, this is craft, it doesn't cost a penny. This is why we have to change the culture of digital product development. If you're a, a, a web developer or mobile app developer and you're 30 years old, you need to know that small text for people like me is really difficult to see. And what are the statistics? 34% of the population is over 50. And when you're, when you're over 50, you're gonna have some kind of issue. In my case, I have waves of clouds in my eyes that obstruct, obstruct my view. Leadership expertise. If you're a CEO, you may not, and you may be thinking about captions. And I love this, this example because you know, I, I had this very thing come up. How many people use captions? What, 1%? What, what does it matter? Well, maybe, maybe the reason that you have 1% of the population using captions is because you haven't done a good job with captions. If you use captions right, and there's a lot to know about it, you're going to find out that 80% of captions users are not deaf. I myself use it, and I know lots of people that use it. And when you're in a sports a bar, for example, or you're in the airport and there's lots of people, lots of different TVs, you need the captions in order to see. Or when it's not COVID, you know, you're in a train, it's another example of where you need to see it. And so you have to have the leadership understand that accessibility really affects a lot more people than we realize and not look so much at the statistics because the statistics are wrong. If you do QA for a living, you need to know that there are power users. Obviously people with disabilities uh, that are screen reader users, for example, use the keyboard, but this helps lots and lots of people. And if you have the expertise, then you know that you need to make sure to do things like use the tab, shift tab, spacebar, et cetera, and test with a screen reader. These are really important. And here's another great example 
I think so many people are inspired by Stephen Hawking, but they're not thinking about what is the experience for Stephen Hawking. And if you have expertise, let's say if you're a product owner, you're gonna know that Stephen Hawking, maybe you won't know the details, but it's clear that he's doing something like using a thumb switch, a blink switch attached to his glasses in his case that control his computer. He squeezes, he's, he would squeeze his cheek muscles and blink to, to uh, trigger an infrared switch that allowed him to scan and select characters on the screen in order to compose speeches or surf the internet do you think that, that Stephen Hawking should have paid his taxes when he was alive? I sure do. But do you think filling out a complicated form that then has a session time out is something that he should have had to deal with? I think all of us know that if you have the expertise, you realize that you work on the edge cases, which is what happens a lot with people that have disabilities, and you 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 learn things like affordances where you, when you have a session timeout, you're allowed to click continue in order to make it last longer. And also perhaps the ability to save your work so that you can come back to it later. This is something that if you have a motor impairment you need, but I don't know of a single person that has not come across this in one case or another. So this is all about expertise. Even if you're a project manager and you see a teeny tiny link, you know, Everybody in the organization can help. And, and this is why it's not about budget, it's really just about expertise. Now I alluded to this earlier, we in the accessibility community just talk about statistics. And I myself have done it for, for, for years, but over time I kind of realized that we're looking at it all wrong. So I haven't heard anybody really speak about this. You have a progression, you have a progression of issues. And so at my age, yes, those, those clouds in my eyes are annoying, but I get around it. And it's like, okay, I'm in my 50s, I'm older. And as you get older and older and older, you get more and more of these issues. My dad didn't think of himself as having a disability. He, could, he couldn't really see, you know, what, 50% vision max, 15% by the end uh, hearing. But he didn't consider himself as having a disability, but the exact same degree of disability at five years old, it would have been, okay, I have a disability. But then as you get older, no, I'm just old. And so we get these weird situations where you have WHO disability statistics and they've done great work. And maybe if you dig in and you read exactly how they worded it, it all makes sense. But the way that we're quoting it is that a billion people worldwide have a disability and that's 15% of the population which sure that, that number sounds like it's important, but then we hear that 2.2 billion people have a visual impairment and that's 28% of the population. So those statistics, those two statistics don't jive. And then you think, okay, over 34% of the population is above 50, like me. So above 50, uh, sorry, ab above 34%, you're talking about one in three. And if you mishmash and add all of these together, what you're really talking about is a, a huge percent of the population has a disability. And really, when you think about it, humans are mortal. And, and, and as you're going through the timeline of your life, it's gonna affect every one of us. It's important for 100% of the population. And that's really the message I wanna leave with you. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you once again, and happy 10th Global Accessibility Awareness Day.